My name is Nicholas Ngigi. My name is Sebastian. I am Katabi. I'm Grace Marianga. I'm Ruth. Daya Stevenson. Jen Magadi. Samuel Kadewa. Christina Vivid. Safi Uzeye. Jaja Uzeye. Agatha Kinefia. Faiza. Dr. John Mwangi. My name is DeAndre Weeks, and I am with Virginia for Africa. I am with Vintendo for Africa. And I am with Vintendo for Africa. And I am with Vintendo for Africa. I am with I am with I am with I I I I I am I I am with Vintendo for Street from It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Ingrid Taylor. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from Xavier University. It's located in Louisiana. She's a doctor, has a doctorate of medicine from the University of Cincinnati. And um, she's done a brief stint in surgery. And now she is a family physician. And she attended a historically black um, college and shared with us that in so doing, she met a lot of African immigrants um, during that experience, particularly um, as professors. And she also shared with us that historically black colleges and universities produce more African-American medical doctors than any other university in the United States. So with no further ado, I introduce Ingrid, Dr. Ingrid Taylor. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, great. I am honored to be here to um, some wonderful experiences that our panelists will share with you to open up the gates for questions, get those answers, um, and kind of compare and contrast various higher educational um, institutions. For further ado, we'll get started. Um, again, when we come to the question and answering um, session, please put your questions in the chat. And then um, we will um, have someone to look at those questions and have you to present them. Um, so we're really, really excited. Um, as we first get started, we do have a poll, and that is, what is your highest level of education? And so um, if someone could put that poll um, just briefly, HBCUs um, were formed after the Civil War. Um, we may have had about three of them before. We definitely had a lot more form after that. And that was because in the United States of America, we had, um, we had legal segregation. So what that meant is for the primarily white institutions of higher learning, nor were you obligated to accept one African American in your institution. And most did not. And if they did, there were very few that came through. And it wasn't until 1964 that um, legalized segregation was illegal. And so when that happened, more African Americans were able to now have um, greater choices of where they wanted to go to school. And as these institutions wanted to increase their diversity, they then helped with the financial aid and so forth so that more African Americans could attend and graduate from primarily um, 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 white institutions. So you may say to yourself, why, um, why is it necessary for us to have HBCUs now since we black people and people of color can go anywhere? Well, we will get further and further into that discussion 
with the HBC. And then last but not least, but certainly very, very um, important, we will be talking about scholarships and financial opportunities for higher education. And we now have the poll results, and I am happy to say that uh, on to higher level of education, almost 20% of us who have attended, uh, 80, 80, 80% um, have attended um, predominantly uh, white institutions um, or, or universities. Dr. Kayla Moore. Uh, she attended Xavier University in Louisiana. She was the first dual major of chemistry and pharmacy, who is an African-American at an HBCU. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from Spelman University and a Bachelor's of Science from Xavier University, both of which are historically Black colleges. She also possesses a Doctor of Pharmacy and PharmD from Xavier University. And she has experienced a number of African immigrant professors at her HBCUs. She attended a predominantly white institution for high school. And we are honored to have her here with us on today. Welcome, Dr. Kayla Moore. Good Dr. afternoon. I'm here. <laughs> Good awesome. afternoon, everyone. Um, well, like she said, I did attend two HBCUs. Um, I am a native of St. Louis, Missouri, um, so I did grow up here and have, you know, learned a lot about our culture here, as well as I do have some ties um, in Atlanta and in Louisiana. And in, well, in a couple of weeks, I should be moving to Chicago to start my residency at Advocate Aurora Healthcare in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and the way that I got involved with this organization is my mother is actually a member of the Lynx organization. Awesome. Glad to have you here. Dr. Thank Taylor, you. are you back? I am back. And thank you guys for your patience with these technical issues that come in and out and knock you off the, the screen. So thank you. Um, the um, other um, panelists that I want, and I'm so excited to introduce you all to, is Dr. David um, Jibinji. And he is comfortable with me calling him Dr. G, which I greatly appreciate. Um, Dr. G is um, currently the area educator at Lincoln University Urban Impact Center in St. Louis. He received his PhD in public policy um, analyst from St. Louis um, University. And um, he is originally from Kenya and has done amazing work there with microfinancing, information and communication technology, um, as well as um, he came here to um, St. Louis. He got his master's in, um, in, in social work from Wash U, and he actually founded the, day, uh, the Dollar a Day Initiative before getting his PhD um, from St. Louis U. So he is really going to um, talk with us when we get to the general discussion about um, the comparison between Africa system and um, the United States. And then I am also very, very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Um, Simolo Sim Jones, who is from um, South Africa. And she has her um, doctorate in education from Missouri Baptist University. Um, she's worked um, with history and English high school students um, in South Africa and then spent 15 years at the um, Circulo College in, of Education as a lecturer. And currently she works at the St. Louis Public Schools District as a teacher for English learners. So I'm really excited about her um, coming to us to talk about um, ways in which um, the education here in the United States um, com and how, um, how we do that here um, 
is 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 helpful or or not. And then lastly, we will have um, Felipe Martinez, who is the serves as the senior student advisor at the Scholarship Foundation of St. Louis. And what he does is he works to support first generation and undocumented um, students gain access to secondary education. So this is really helpful for any of you all who may um, have some children who are interested in um, going to college here in the United States, what type of financial opportunities uh, may be available for them. So without further ado, I want to go to the general kind of discussion. And first, I would like to ask a question to Dr. G. Dr. G, could you please talk a little bit about the educational system, particularly in pursuit of um, higher education? in um, your country of origin and compare that to um, the system of education in Africa versus the United States. And can you tell us some of the similarities and some of the differences? Uh, thank you, hi. Uh, my name is uh, <clears throat> David Gedenji. I'm a child of two worlds because uh, I went to school in Africa, then uh, I have spent time here in the U.S. I have gone to uh, uh, predominantly white school, and now I'm teaching in a historic, historical, historically black university, HBCU, that is uh, Lincoln University. And so I'll just take a minute in the interest of time to compare the education system in Kenya and also in the U.S., and I'll start by saying that uh, one thing that is similar is uh, uh, my country, Kenya, and uh, a few other countries in Africa have adopted the education system that has been uh, in use here in the U.S. Uh, many years. Uh, because uh, uh, in Kenya, we have got uh, eight years of what we call uh, primary education. That is like uh, elementary and middle school in the U.S. And then we have got... Uh, four years of what we call high school, similar to the high school education here. And then uh, we have got uh, four years uh, of education at the university. So in Kenya, we popularly call that system the 844, which is uh, very similar to what we have here. And uh, maybe on the area of difference, one thing that I can mention that is different is that uh, uh, one thing that I've liked with the U.S. education system is that uh, it emphasizes a lot on practice so that uh, uh, people who have gone to school in the U.S., they are more hard on so that I hear my son telling me that, Daddy, I can do it. I want to do this. <laughs> that to me is good. Uh, but going back home, uh, because we are not very much advanced in technology, I must admit that there are some issues that we have not been able to do well, especially areas uh, like science and technology that require a lot of hands on and practice. Uh, our graduates are <clears throat> more, 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 more theoretical uh, than practical. So that the education system, uh, I'll talk about my country, they emphasize more on the theory rather than the practice, uh, here in the U.S., there is more emphasis on be, being able to do it, the hands-on knowledge. I'll also say that in, in Kenya and in Africa, there are some areas that we do, that we do very well, especially on the side of practice, uh, the area that I would call ex experiential learning, that is learning by doing, and that is mostly seen in, in areas like uh, agriculture, because uh, most of Africa is uh, basically agriculture, like 75% of the economy depends on agriculture. <clears throat> so there is a lot of hard song. So that uh, even as after school, most of the work that you are doing is in the farm, is hard song. So some areas, especially areas that require advanced technology, we are more theoretical. The US is good because uh, there is, it's well advanced technologically. So there is a lot of uh, that hard song experience. But I must mention that even in a, a place like Kenya, 
areas like uh, agricultural development, our people are also hard on. They graduate with a lot of uh, uh, experiential learning and they can be able to go out there and practice. So I think I'll stop there. And I know that we'll have another moment to move on with this, uh, uh, with this topic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was very interesting, um, the differences and the similarities, um, which um, probably attest to when um, people from Africa come to the United States and do come to our higher learning um, educational systems, they've already got the same type of schedule training that, you know, 844 is what we do here. So it should be, uh, um, an easier, easy tr transition. So Dr. Jones, um, do you, in your experience, can you talk about Africans' families push um, for, their for their children to study abroad in Western countries? comparing that to wanting to um, further their education in their own home country? Yes. Um, my observation is that most African parents would love their kids to come to the United States or learn abroad because, number one, um, it has something to do with, um, you know, finances. The education, for instance, here in the United States is free. Um, number two, they have to pay for tuition back home. They have to pay uh, for book fee. They have to pay for uniform. Things that you don't necessarily have to worry about here in the United States. The second um, reason that, of course, you know, parents would love their kids to study abroad is because of the language, English. English is a language of power. Mm -hmm. It is a universal language. So the, the, the better you speak the language back home, the, you know, the better the job you know, their children can get. And so if they are here, if they start in the United States, for instance, and then they go back home, there is a um, likelihood that they will get a very good job. Um, you know, like, of course, you know, they, they speak like, um, almost like the boss. The boss meaning, you know, some of us were colonized by the British. So, um, that's where it's coming from, you know, saying that it is the language of power. When you learn, um, you know, courses or you take courses like social linguistics, it really clarifies why English is such a, a powerful language um, all over the world. But then I must also admit that, um, you know, there are, even though, even though, you know, the U.S. and most countries abroad have, you know, they, they are so developed in technology and other things that in resources, you know, they have resources in the classrooms. The little that we do have, and I'm glad that uh, Dr. G did mention that, you know, um, uh, back home, kids do learn uh, experimental or uh, experimental um, education. You know, there is some kind of hands-on education, but it is also relevant to the country. It is also relevant. Whatever they do is relevant to what the masses need, mm -hmm. you know. So many African leaders have, um, they have, desired to address the, 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 the question of poverty, the problem of poverty. Um, and so the, the first thing that they, they usually address would be agriculture. So I'm saying that to say, yes, indeed, we may not be well-developed technologically, 
but there are some things that we we do excel in in our educational system um as a result when some of those kids come here in the United States, most of the things that they are doing, they have already done before, you know, back home. And if you could go to the slide that shows um, the statistics, I'd really appreciate it. So one of the misconceptions, honestly, that I wanted to highlight in this presentation is that even though even though um, countries like the U.S., Western countries like the U.S., you know, uh, develop technologically, but they are still lacking, you know. Um, I looked at the, the results of, um, of NIAP. NIAP, I think, uh, stands for National Educational, um, National Assessment Educational progress it's like it's like the, the the progress card that the schools and districts school districts get from from this particular um organization so it showed that in 1992 and this was the the student performance on math and reading um in american schools but this one in particular was on math so the whole nation in 1992, you know, the, 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 the average score for all the children was 18%. For public schools, it was 17 And then 2009, 39%. And the public schools, 38%. 2019, 41%. And for both 1999 and 2009, it was, it was without accommodations. But in 2019, it was with accommodations. So I'm saying that to say, even though we push our children, and I am I'm one of those parents, and had I known what I know today, I, I definitely would not have moved my kids to the United States. Honestly, honestly, honestly. Um, until a certain level. Um, so even though, you know, we push our kids, we want our kids to come start elementary school or middle school here in the United States, I am not certain whether that is a good move to some extent um, I teach in a public school, and what I see, honestly, is heartbreaking, um, which is why, you know, one would really love, I, I particularly, I have been offered um, many posts. I started here in, in a county, I won't mention um, where I live, but I started uh, being, when I first came, I was a, a teacher assistant in one of the county uh, districts here uh, in St. Louis. And I was offered a job, but I had, had my husband at the time was teaching for um, a public school. And I had, I had heard him talk about things that were going on in this public school. And I said, that's where I belong. Um, I felt like I could make an impact, you know, in the lives of those young men and women. So I'm saying that to say, uh, yes, indeed, we push our children to come to the United States, but the United States is also lacking. And I, I want to stop right there in the interest of time. Well, well thank you so much um, for that observation um, I I in my head have a number of follow-up um, questions and and that would be um, and um, I know we look at both the educational system in Africa and in the United States and we look at opportunities for learning and how that is applied. 
when you particularly look at African Americans and their performance, um, um, slide that you showed, Dr. Jones. Um, my question to you both is, are the same social challenges that African Americans students may face, such as poverty, finances, um, social stresses, um, as far as just not getting shot, um, if you're working in the city, um, those type of things. Are those similar um, experiences that you may find that students in various um, provinces in Africa, how do they perform academically given the same social um, challenges? Um, I want to address poverty. Um, you've got to understand that back home in order for one to get a job one has got to be educated in order for one to get money you have to or even a job you have to have educate some kind of education so that alone is a drive for one to get a job okay and again remember that element that i mentioned earlier of education not being free all right when, when you think of all those things, I remember I had to keep my books for my younger siblings. We had to cover books. Our, some of the things were very surprising to me. I noticed that textbooks were not covered. Back home, we, we had to preserve them so that we, can, we could give them to our siblings that come you know, after us. So I'm saying that to say, just getting education because that's the only way you can survive, the only way you can eat, the only way you can work. And of course, when I say you can eat, I mean like living a, an affordable life. Um, of course, people do mm. their gardens and they're able to eat from that. But I'm just talking about having money, you know, it is only through getting education. So that alone is, um, it becomes a motivation for one to get education. Poverty, yes. But I cannot say that, you know, the, the, the question of, the, of racial injustice is not, it's not even a question because even in the midst of that poverty, you have relatives that pitch in here and there. Um, you know, if you, if you have an older sibling, it's like one of those land laws, if, you know, so to speak, if I may use that word, that you know that once you graduate, you have to educate your younger siblings if your parents, you know, don't have means, you know. So what I'm saying is I believe that there are similarities as far as poverty is concerned, but as for social justice, injustice, I mean, um, they, they, I cannot attest to that. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I, I, I'll take, I I'll appreciate it. Uh, that comparison, Dr. G. Yeah, I'll, I'll take Please. a minute and, and also respond to that. And I'll say that uh, some of the challenges that people of color experience in this country, uh, like uh, poverty, as has been said by, by my colleague, and uh, things like violence, and many of the challenges that we know they also back there in Africa, the only difference is that uh, the approach to some of those challenges is different. In Africa, some of those challenges are addressed through family and community. In Africa, we have got a very strong sense mm. of family. We have got a very strong sense of community. 
so that the child belongs to the village, mm -hmm. the child belongs to the community, so that uh, your, your next door neighbor is your mentor. The teacher who lives a mile away is also your mentor. And there is strong family ties and strong family networks. And those ones are a very strong form of therapy. So poverty levels are higher in Africa than I have seen here. Violence in Africa can get very severe. You know the violence that you have had in places like the Great Lakes and Sudan. But the beauty is that family and community is strong. And family and community are finding solutions to some of these challenges every day. They are, provided, they are providing therapy. They are also a form of cushion so that you have somebody to cushion you. The family, the community, the people around you, they cushion you and they mentor you and you are able to rise up and get moving. Here in, here in the US, the situation is a bit different because uh, we are more or less an individualistic society. And uh, some of the solutions that we find here are more governmental, they are more non-for-profit, they are more like we are doing right now. That's a little bit different in Africa. So there are all those similarities and experiences and the approaches and solutions are different depending on where you are. Thank you. And, and if, if I may add to the individualistic... I'm sorry. Please. Oh, Dr. Taylor. Please. Oh, I was saying ju ju just yes. one point. Oh, I was saying if I could just add to that um, element of um, the individualistic um approach you know one one other thing that um really struck me when i first came here was the fact that once a child turns 18 not even his parent can support him you know in and i'm saying that in the sense that you know if a child gets into trouble with with the law um, and want to know what did what did he do? They don't tell you. They'll tell you that child. The child is um, he, he's a, he's a, he, he's not a minor anymore. So I find that to be very detrimental to the unity of the community. Mm. That, that that's that's just one point. That that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I am so I am so intrigued by this, and this is this is the sharing that you know I I enjoy. So thank you all um, for the comments. And now, Giselle, I believe is going to uh, monitor the HBCU. So I'm going to take my monitor hat off and and pass it on to Giselle, and uh, we will move. Um, to the next segment, but thank you both, Dr. G and Dr. Jones, for your insight. That was that was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ingrid Taylor. Okay. Now you can put your panelist hat on. As okay. you can tell, everyone, um, Dr. Taylor is playing two roles for us today, and we thank her for that. This, I want to welcome each and every one of you to our HBCU seg segment. HBCU stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. At the opening of our session today, um, Ingrid <clears throat> um, did share some insights in regards to that, but I'm going to ask her um, to start off by answering a few questions. And if you can hear me, Ingrid, your bandwidth is low again. Maybe try to turn off your camera to see if we can at least hear you. Um, and the first question that I have is for you to share with us the definition of a historically black college, um, the reason or the rationale why they were created, and if you would share what their relevance is today as an opening to this segment of, um, to this segment. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Are you, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Great, great, great. Okay. So, uh, okay, here, historically, um, black colleges and universities, again, were formed um, after the Civil War 
because um, we had legal segregation in the United States. There education institutions that were predominantly white did not have to, nor were they, accepting African Americans at their institution. Some, if they did, were few and far and historically black colleges and, and um, um, universities were placed in the South. And over um, time, after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which made it illegal to have um, segregated uh, systems, we um, now have um, people of color with multiple choices of where they want to go to school. And right now we have about 101 HBCUs, but out of those 101, HBCUs make up less than 3% of the colleges they enroll. 12% of all African Americans, they produce 23% of all African American graduates, 40% of all students who um, major in um, science, um, technology, education, and math, 60% of all engineers in the United States of America that are African-American, 60% of them finished in HBCU. 80% of all judges that are, of, are African-American in the United States came from an HBCU. And 70% of all our African American came from an HBCU and are now allowed people of African Americans can go anywhere that they want to go. And many um, primarily uh, white institutions are working hard to increase the diversity within their institution. Um, African Americans, there are many African Americans who are still choosing to go to HBCUs. And so I can say from my own personal experience <clears throat> that um, there are, there's a one nurturing home when a uh, African American goes to an HBCU and and I was really um, intrigued by the 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 Dr. G and Dr. Jones talking about community and well at HBCUs that's the environment African American as I said that, I said, well, can you find on paper, can you, can you prove, prove that this happens? And actually, the Gallup U.S. Um, funds of uh, minority college and graduate report actually found that Black HBCU graduates are more likely than Blacks from non-HBCUs to strongly agree that their university prepared them well for life outside of college. And the experience that Blacks who include, they can find at least one professor who made them excited about learning. They found a professor that cared about them as a person and they found a mentor that um, encouraged them to reach their goals and their dreams. And this was more likely uh, for Black graduates of HBCUs than for Blacks 
who went to non-HBCUs to be experienced this at one time through their college education. In addition, many um, HBCU students were more likely than non-HBC students to be able to be involved in applied internships, long-term projects, and extracurricular activities. So um, their relevance today is I think, uh, or I know, that the sense of community, the sense of belonging, the sense that you are important, the sense that you have a dream to do something that somebody else said you couldn't, actually you can have it. The ability to see 50% of um, tenured professors are African American at HBCUs, 50%. So. I never in my life had witnessed until I went to Xavier. I never interacted with a PhD mathematician until I went to Xavier. So the thought of any student coming there could actually physically see if they wanted to do math for the rest of their life. They actually saw that physically happening every day when they went to class, or if they dreamed to be a physicist, the chair of the department of Xavier's physics was an African-American male. And so that type of mentoring happened um, consistently. And so sometimes people have the myth that HBCUs accept lower caliber, less academic um, types of students. And I will say, particularly with Xavier University, Asian, that's all the universities in the entire United States of America, it is number one in having an African -Amer African American graduates complete medical school, number one. And in 2000, they had 94 students go to medical school, which was more than Harvard, John Hopkins, and the University of Maryland combined. So I have seen Xavier take someone with a 2-5, and send them to Harvard Medical School. And I have seen Xavier take someone who failed at another school who is now an allerg a physician who specializes in allergies. So it sounds, to what happens in African communities wrap their arms around students and push them and support them and encourage them to reach their goal. So that's the relevance of HBCUs. Of the United States of America, the first female and the first African-American, she graduated from Howard University, an HBCU. So that's all, I'm gonna leave it at that, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I'd like to direct my next question set to, um, to Dr. Moore. And um, Dr. Taylor t touched on it a little bit, but you know, it is said by some that the quality of education at HBCUs is inferior to that of pri primarily white institutions. So my first question to you is, how has such a negative stereotype and misconceptions been damaging to HBCU institutions? Um, for me, I won't say that it was damaging to the institution themselves, but um, like I said, I did grow up in St. Louis, you know, in St. Louis, and I actually went to MICDS, Mary Sue Country Day School, which is out in the middle of Ladue. So I was in a predominantly white community from fifth grade all the way up until high school. 
So I think that kind of, you know, going back to the first question as well, one reason why I was so inclined to go to HBCU is because I spent my whole life surrounded by whites or um, non-minority Americans that I was ready to be in a community that looked like me, that was excelling like me, that was pushing me to be greater. And I remember even having these discussions with my college counselor, like, I want to go to Spelman College. And he was like, well, maybe you should look at Purdue or Emory. That's where you were accepted. And I was like, those institutions are great, but I kind of have my whole life to be a minority. So why not take the opportunity to learn from people who look like me, who are not only going to be those embracing arms that I didn't get while I was here. Well, I had to fight for my way to get to the position that I was in. And so when I got to these HBCUs, um, I think the, my main reason for going there was to basically be able to go back to my school and be like, yes, I went here and look what I became now. I became um, the first dual degree at Xavier University. I not, attended, I not attended one, but two HBCUs and became one of the most qualified people in my class. Um, so I think that the negative stereotypes and misconceptions is more with um, other races or like outside of our community. And I do feel like um, you sometimes have to fight for yourself or especially when it came to me applying for residencies as well. But when you hear me speak and when you hear how I can eloquently put whatever points I'm trying to get across and know that that was the knowledge that I gained at HBCU, not what was learned at um, a predominantly white institution. So I do, I am grateful for attending a predominantly white institution as far as me able to navigate kind of both worlds. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think that I would be where I am today if I had not attended the HBCU. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Would mm -hmm. you also share with us um, insights around the general quality of students that are admitted to HBCUs? Yeah. Um, so kind of like about what Dr. Taylor said, um, I will say that I went from being the token kind of black girl at my predominantly white school to being at HBCU where everybody was kind of the token black girl. Everybody had above the 3.5 GPA. So being able to excel in that environment let me know that I wasn't getting it just because I was black. It was because I was academically being challenged and being able to step up to the caliber of what my institutions required of me. So I think that um, it was kind of a struggle or maybe a little beating to my confidence at first, um, looking around and being like, well, everybody's just as good as me. How am I supposed to stand out? But like I said, I did have those mentors, um, not only in the classroom, but like financial aid, my um, um, residence in the halls or even my uh, resident director in my art <laughs> was uh, definitely somebody who was more of like a mother to me or a mothering figure. And I will say that, especially when it came to summer opportunities, I always knew what I was doing when it came time for me to leave for the summer. A lot of my friends who were um, attending predominantly white institutions, they were still trying to figure it out or they didn't really have the connections to be able to. Whereas at these HBCUs, you're getting emails on a daily basis from your department like, hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Like, I feel like one thing that HBCUs do is definitely give you the family catering environment that's not only going to, you know, give you what you need to succeed outside, but also going to give you the um, information, the tools, the networking opportunities for people who have been in your shoes. And even for Black, she said, I, one of my classmates um, actually had like a 2.3 GPA um, in high school, didn't have any scholarship money. But when he got to HBCU, he had that faculty support to push him to do better, ended up leaving um, Xavier. I think he ended up having at least 75% of his academics paid for it just because he had those people in the financial aid office, not only looking out for him, but he was academically putting in the work to do so. So the quality of students, I think, is just comparable to PWIs, if not even better, because you have those students who do want to represent their school well. Awesome. Last question I want to ask you, can you share with us about the quality, quality and the caliber of your professors at HBC? Yeah. So um, a lot of college professors do have, you know, PhDs, but a majority of my professors were African or um, at least African-American in a sense of having a higher education and being at the forefront of the classroom where I was used to in high school and middle school, only being around mainly white female teachers. Um, so I think that not only having somebody who looks like me at the front of the classroom push me to want to do more or excel more, but having somebody who looked like me also was just kind of like, hey, if he can do it, I can do it too. And I know that he's going to be looking out for me just as much as 
I need to be getting this paper done. I know that I can probably talk to him about some of the issues that he could actually understand rather than trying to look through it from a white or lens. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Very, very impressive and very informative, both you and Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much for the insights in regard to HBCUs. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Taylor so we can do a brief Q&A session so that we can address questions that anyone has um, in regards to the general, the general discussion that we had, as well as the H HBCU segment. And we have about five minutes for that. And I would ask um, Adjua if you can um, monitor, the monitor the chat and um, share what the next question is so that um, Dr. Ingrid can take the helm. Okay. Um, we have uh, one question to get started with. Um, so this is for Dr. G and Dr. Simola. Uh, during a student's education, uh, is it easy for them to transition from a school in Africa to the U.S. and vice versa? And also, when is it easier to do so? And what are some obstacles that are faced? Um, if Dr. G will allow me, I would like to take that question first. Um, I teach... English learners, um, some of you know them as uh, being called students who learn English for speakers of other languages, OL. Um, most unfortunately, the transition is not that easy. It's mm -hmm. not easy because when they get here, their transcripts, just like as adults who want to, um, if you are a professional, like myself, I was a teacher before I came here, and my credentials had to be evaluated somewhere else, and then the Department of Education um, had to say, okay, you need to do this course, this course, and that course in order to teach in the American classroom. Even with them, the transition is not easy. Um, it is possible that, I remember one student of mine, he had just finished um, 12th grade, the last grade of high school. And when he got here and he was going to do engineering, he says, but then when he got here, he was uh, placed in ninth grade. So the transition is not very easy because it is based on a test that they are given. It is a placement test for English language learners. And my, some, some, of the, some of the readings, honestly, are kind of biased. And so our, our kids don't do well um, in those tests. And because of the scores that they get on those tests, they are placed at... Um, maybe a ninth grade you know, class or level um, while they were already, you know, when they had already finished um, high school. So the transition is not easy. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. I will say that uh, the world has the perception that uh, that which comes from Africa is uh, inferior, and uh, that which comes from the West is uh, superior. So much so that when somebody is coming from the US or from Europe and they are going to Africa, they can easily join an African school and get started. But when you are coming from uh, Africa and you are coming to the US, uh, there are so many hurdles. You can imagine somebody who has uh, a bachelor's degree from Africa or even a master's degree, being subjected to do TOEFL exam, that is uh, the test of English, and you have done all your secondary school or your high school or your university in English, and then you are being subjected to take a basic exam in English so that you can join school. And uh, you people are aware that uh, there are many people from Africa who have graduated with a uh, very prestigious degrees like medicine, engineering, law, and others who come to the U.S., but because there are so many hurdles, they cannot be able to cope. And many of them, you find them doing 
uh, small jobs like being a, a trucker, you know, because the system cannot allow you to continue. The system cannot allow you to practice. So there is that an even playground such that people coming from Africa to the U.S., they find it very difficult to transition. Thank you. That's very true. That really reflects a lot of the experiences that I've been witnessing. So I really wanted to hear your opinion on that as well. Uh, the next question is for uh, Dr. Moore and Dr. Taylor. Uh, what is one aspect or experience unique to an HBCU that you enjoyed your most during your time there? I guess I'll go first. Um, for me, um, to be quite honest, the thing that I love most about my HBCUs was definitely um, homecoming and being able to join my sorority, not only, you know, for social aspects, but um, it allowed me the chance to not only be involved in my community, but that was an even bigger networking opportunity for me. Um, actually, the residency that I'm in today was actually an email sent to me by one of my um older sororers who was like, hey, like this position is available. I know this director, give her an email. And I actually got an interview before the residency process even started. So I think that the biggest thing that you can gain from an HBCU is like the family atmosphere because there's always someone who has your back. Um, and like I said, they're just because they look like you, they automatically kind of have an understanding of some of these social issues that you might come back, rather it's in the academic field or in the social world, or even in your career as well, as far as trying to get out of those or stand above those stereotypical Black um, concepts, or I want to say just um, stereotypes, I guess, about what you're supposed to bring to the table and how you're supposed to act and how you rise above that. Thank you. I, I will say that um, for me, um, the most memorable experience I had was actually um, every, everybody at an age BCU wants you to be successful, okay? Not just the black professors, the white professors want you to be. I was a pre-med taking, I'll never forget this, taking organic chemistry and it was killing me. I mean, I was staying up all night. I was trying to figure it out. It was very challenging. And I mean, I worked real hard to get uh, an A out of that class, real hard. But in the process of going through that, I went to my um, pre-med advisor who was a Caucasian man name is Dr. Carmichael, who had a machine going on how to get us prepared for medical school. And I told him, I said, oh, my God, this class is killing me. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know. Maybe I should choose a different major. Maybe I shouldn't do medicine. And usually this is the time that breaks you when you are at your lowest. And I'll never forget that professor said, oh, you're going to get out of this chemistry class and you are going to be a doctor. And that's the difference between an HBCU and a lot of times, but not all the time, um, institutions are, are struggling at your worst. They say, you know what, maybe medicine isn't right for you. Maybe you just, just don't have it and you need to do something else. HBCU, where someone will say, let's figure it out because you will be a doctor. So that's probably the greatest. And then obviously there's many leaders. And I'm a Delta, um, and I pledged at Xavier, and I had all of those amazing experiences, too. So. Thank you so much to both of you for answering the question. I'm going to pass it on back to Giselle. Actually, it is Ingrid is back to being the moderator. Oh, 
great. Doctor. I'm the moderator again. Okay, so I have that hat on. Okay. And I am so happy now. Um, we have Felipe Martinez here, who um, I think can kind of put the, the bow at the end of this pack on the top of the package. Um, he serves, I'm sorry, he, a student advisor at the Scholarship Foundation of St. Louis, where they work to support first-generation and undocumented students across their post-secondary um, education. In addition, um, Felipe provides significant training and resources to the St. Louis area guidance counselors and non-for-profit panel. Um, were facing first generation and a native of California. Sorry, he came from California, and um, he uh, we have a, a degree from the University of California in San Diego. So, without further ado, um, Felipe Martinez, please please come forth and, and share with us. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Awesome, awesome. Yes. Thanks for having me tonight. I'm happy to answer questions you have about the Scholarship Foundation and any discussion that we want to have as well. Great, 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 great. So I have several questions for you, um, Felipe. Uh -huh. And the first one is, um, please provide an overview of the purpose of the Scholarship for, um, Foundation of St. Louis. And can you share with us the impact of your organization um, in this region and also any resources that um, some of our um, um, attendees might look to the Scholarship um, Foundation for help as far as if they have a, a, a child may be interested in um, higher education. Sure, definitely, definitely, yeah. So, um, so I'm Felipe Martinez. I'm the Senior Student Advisor at the Scholarship Foundation of St. Louis, which is a 100-year-old not-for-profit organization in St. Louis. It was founded in 1920, based upon the conviction that an educated society is essential to a healthy democracy. And what we do is we provide access to post-secondary education for members of our community who might not otherwise have the financial means to meet their educational goals. And we do that by promoting and providing financial support for post-secondary education. We assure that students have the necessary information to make sound financial decisions when they go off to college. And at the foundation, we also help lead a community collaborative network um, educational and community partners who are aligned to support students through preparation, transition, and persistence to degree completion. Um, I think for the impact on the region, uh, we like to highlight three A's at the Scholarship Foundation, that is awarding, advising, and advocacy. So the first one is awarding. We offer about $5 million to about 500 students annually in the form of interest-free, fee-free student loans, scholarships and grants. And we also have paid internships, all which are need-based and last dollar opportunities. We, uh, the second A is advising. We have a robust advising team. We provide guidance and support to St. Louis area students and families as they navigate the various processes of admissions and financial aid systems in higher education. And annually, we serve close to 6,000 students with need to know information. Um, and we help accompany them on their journey uh, if that's what's needed. Uh, so the advisors work very closely with high school students and current college students. Um, and the third A is advocacy. So while we can't fund every student in St. Louis like we would like to, what we can do is make sure that we are engaging students and recent graduates to help them identify, analyze, and lead efforts to influence policy that affects them at the school, state, and federal level. As far as resources go, I think um, two of the, um, I'm sorry, did you say resources or you wanted to know about eligibility? Oh. 
I said resources, but uh -huh. you can talk about resources and I'll Okay, awesome. Yeah, so we do have, res I'll, I'll talk about some of the services that we have at the foundation that we provide. Um, but as far as eligibility is definitely something I like to talk about. Um, uh, applicants for interest-free, fee-free student loans and scholarships and grants that are provided directly through the Scholarship Foundation, the eligibility criteria, the baseline criteria is that applicants have to have uh, resided in the St. Louis metro region for two years prior to the date of their application. And they have to have a minimum high school GPA of a 2.0. So we're not looking only for valedictorians, though we gladly accept a valedictorian. We're also looking for every student who wants to go to school and complete their coursework. Um, so we're really looking for a student who goes to class and makes that grade of a 2.0 GPA average. In order to access those services, um, interest-free, fee-free student loans and outright grants, uh, we offer those to students pursuing their first-time bachelor's, associate's, or technical degrees at an accredited not-for-profit institution in the U.S. Um, we have the advising team, which provides information and guidance to assist almost 6,000 students annually in determining educational opportunities that they can pursue after high school. And we conduct free public workshops for students and their families and members of the community so that they can learn more about financial aid, you know, deciphering confusing official notifications, aid eligibility, things like that, and helping families and students become more familiar with the basic principles of financial literacy and going to college. Great. Thank you so much. I was wondering, does anyone have any questions for Felipe Martinez? Yes, I do. Um, Felipe, I, as I have said before, I teach immigrant students and some of them are undocumented. Mm -hmm. Do you also assist them? And if you do, how do they go about um, obtaining a scholarship? from your foundation? Yes, definitely. So there's an application cycle. I think the easiest thing to do would be for a student to go to the Scholarship Foundation's website and seek out an advisor. Um, I would be uh, the ideal person to talk to. I serve as an immigrant student advisor also. Um, like I said, I'm very proud to talk about there's no immigration status requirement at the Scholarship Foundation. So undocumented students, whether they have DACA or not, are eligible to apply for opportunities that are hosted directly through the foundation. And then, of course, different opportunities have different eligibility criteria, so students would have to look closely, but an advisor myself can definitely help students think about that work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. I just want to thank everyone who has participated. This has just been a very amazing um, learning experience for me. I have greatly appreciated sharing my experience. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, time is running short, and I am going to pass this on to um, Jeffrey, but again, I greatly appreciate everyone's time and sharing their experience. And it has been very enlightening for me. And I hope for everyone who's been able to listen to this um, opportunity. So um, Jeffrey, if you um, want to close us out, that would be great. Great, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Ingrid. That was uh, really good. And uh, Giselle, thank you so much for that uh, uh, discussion. Uh, but also thanking also our speakers tonight uh, for your great information. I'm really, really uh, learning a lot. I, I really appreciate uh, uh, for Felipe. I hope yeah. I got it right. Uh, that information is really good. I actually didn't know about uh, the eligibility that if you are not, even not a non-documented people can also be able to access. I mean, I am also eligible for that scholarship. And, and I know I have had so many questions coming from people about that. Uh, so that, that is really, I'm glad that you're able to join us tonight and be able to share, to, to talk to us. I hope you will be able to share your contacts uh, on your chat if somebody wants to do a follow-up. Uh, to learn about that. But there was another question that came out there, I don't know, uh, for those who speak, especially 
Uh, Dr. Keller and uh, Ingrid, that somebody was asking about uh, uh, some of the institutions or, or where you we can be able to, if somebody is interested to find the best uh, HBCU college that is good in engineering or is good in, uh, like you said, as in the doctor area, do you have some uh, uh, resources that you can share? Somebody can be able to follow up and find, I mean, where they can find that information. Yes, definitely. Are you asking me, Jeffrey? Uh, I was, uh, I think oh, that would, yeah. would be, uh, because if you have information, that's fine. But I think there are people. Oh, yeah, sure, definitely. <laughs> and, uh, information about the HBCU colleges that would be good for a specific career, uh, career field. Uh, if you may have. There, I there is um, actually a website that has a lot of information about HBCUs and so that you can, and that question was actually on point. Um, each one is probably known for, you know, a certain area. So um, what I could do is I could send that um, website to you, Jeff, Jeffrey, and um, if you could share that with your um, your group, um, that would be that would be probably the best because there there are several um, websites that I think can give people um, some information of you know if you want to do science, if you want to do pharmacy, if you want to do business, if you want to do um, engineering. What are the top schools for that? Awesome. Awesome. I think that would be very helpful. And uh, if you have, if you get it as we, as you speak, you can also maybe post it in the chat. But if I'm sure we can be able to share it on the email with the people who had registered for this event. Uh, I think I'm looking at the time here. It's 7.57. So we're just right on time. Mm -hmm. But I want to say thank you so much, even for the people who were able to log in tonight. And uh, for the last one or 30 minutes to be with us. Uh, it, it's a great, great honor to be able to bring this to you and uh, to be able to help uh, with information as uh, maybe people need it. But more importantly, be able to address some of the misconceptions. I think for me, as I was listening, there's a lot of information that I didn't know. And, and I think it's because of what I have been told or what I've heard about it. But uh, listening to some of the statistics that you've shared, it tells me that uh, there is a lot of, uh, and I think also listening to Dr. Kalamo talking about the experiences and the love and care that you get, uh, just being in an environment for people that you see that they look like you, who may uh, definitely, I'll say, they understand the challenges that you're going through and they really want to make sure to see that you succeed because they know the challenges we as African community maybe go through. Uh, so they're not just there to and their paycheck, but they're also there to see that they make an impact or they impact in, uh, they, they impact some life of those the students who come into, into those colleges. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, this is one of the many, many forums that uh, we have flying up and uh, that uh, we continue to, con to share with you, to bring to you guys, hoping that uh, in the long run, I think say, uh, let's say maybe a couple of, uh, Yes, now we'll look back and say that uh, I'm glad that we were able to connect with uh, the links incorporated. Uh, and uh, and uh, like many people say, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Uh, so that is what we're trying to do here. We know that uh, the challenges we face as African Americans, the challenges we face as African immigrants, there are many, and we cannot be able to deal to handle them alone. So bringing our effort together and combining our effort uh, will totally help us to go uh, far, but it will also be able to help us accomplish more and be able to change uh, the, the, the region in many different ways, including the economic and uh, contribution to, uh, to the region. I want to say that uh, uh, the, for upcoming events, I'm sure we're going to line up for another event coming up maybe in a couple of uh, weeks uh, or month. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get everybody who is on board to join us. Uh, I want to also say that uh, there, we are still continue to educate, to encourage people to participate in vaccine. Uh, this Saturday, there is a vaccine event that is going to be at JFK Community Center. 
And uh, we're doing that in partnership with uh, Delwood Pharmacy. Uh, also, if uh, you were in the uh, in International Institute area, you can be able to access, uh, I mean, to get uh, the vaccine at the International Institute. Uh, most of them, are the, now they are just doing, you just walk in. You don't necessarily have to make a reservation or to register. And then uh, I'm also inviting everyone to join us on June 16. Uh, we will be uh, having a conversation with uh, diversity and inclusion uh, on uh, uh, relating to how to connect with the immigrants. Uh, I'm sure we'll be able to share that information on the email um, so that at least you can be able to hear more on how you as an African-American, you as an American, you as uh, African immigrants, what are the little things that we can be able to do to be able to help us move the needle about this uh, diversity and inclusion, and, and more so to be more welcoming as a region uh, and, and uh, to, to make everybody feel part of this St. Louis. Uh, and I'm glad to be part of the great uh, team that has been lined up to bring that to be in that conversation. So if you have anything that maybe any suggestion of some of the topics that we think uh, we need to continue uh, in this conversation, I think I would drop my email there on the chat. You can always be able to reach out to us um, or you can be able to visit our website and be able to share to put uh, any information that you think can be very helpful. Uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, I would say thank you so much for being part of this. Again, have a nice weekend and let's keep on working together. Thank you. Thank you All so right, thank much. You. Uh, you can also check more information from the links incorporated. I think, uh, Giselle, I don't know if you post some uh, link for the website. I always encourage if you're an African immigrant and you wanted to build a lot of network, visit uh, the, uh, the links incorporated. And uh, if you want, I will encourage you to be a member because when you're empowered, the community is empowered. How does one become a member? All right. Giselle, you are Giselle. <laughs> Yeah, we will, I will also share that information and some of the contacts, but I think the website will be a good way to log in and uh, uh, find some of the areas uh, that they're, I think I believe there are different chapters and uh, addressing different top uh, different uh, uh, topics. Maybe you can pick up whichever fits you, matches you, what you may be looking for. Thank you so much and uh, wish you a nice uh, weekend, coming up weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you. My name is Nicholas Ngigi. My name is Sebastian. I am Padavi. I'm Grace Marianga. I'm Ruth. Dias Davidson. Jen Magadi. Tamiu Kadewa. Christina Vivid. Safi Uzeye. Jaja Uzeye. Agatha Kinefia. Faiza. Dr. John Mwangi. My name is DeAndre Weeks, and I am with Vitina for Africa. I am with Vintendo for Africa. And I am with Vitendo for Africa. And I am with Vitendo for Africa. I am with 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 I